And then this morning opened with uh, talking about the sort of teleology that's often involved in discussions of the creation of Pakistan and the history of the Muslim League. And that's certainly true. I mean, there is this, this narrative of a kind of inevitable progression and the Muslim League playing a critical role, which is, you find quite prominently in Pakistan itself, of course. But there's another sort of teleology of, of histories of the Muslim League, which it has a very different slant to it and which in fact is much more common in academic writing which is the the Muslim League as the kind of poor cousin to the Congress the Muslim League which uh, for whatever its its role in the creation of Pakistan was so lacking in basic structures of organization that its failures pave the way for the failure of Pakistan as a state subsequently, which again is a very common narrative that one finds. And what I'd like to do is try to, I mean, it's, it's of course impossible to avoid these, these kinds of stories, but what I, I want to do is try to step back a bit from them, I hope, and try to just ask the question, what was the Muslim League? And this brings us back to this uh, question that DePage actually raised this morning about what was a political party? What was the nature of the Muslim League? And my argument would be that the Muslim League, of course, changes over time, and it's very different things at different times. And, and more than that, there are very different notions of what the Muslim community might be as a political community that are embodied in the Muslim League. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to use that as a starting point and lay out what I see as at least a couple different visions of community as a political entity that are embodied in the way the Muslim League is structured and then say a little bit about how these in part come together and in part do not come together in creating a Muslim League in the years right before the creation of Pakistan, which I think is quite different from anything it's been um, before that. So, so what I'd like to do is, is start with a discussion about the Muslim League as it first comes into existence. And here my focus, just simply because I know a little bit more about this, will be particularly on the, on the Punjab. Uh, but the Muslim League is, is um, founded in the Punjab, of course, quite shortly after the Shimla deputation. And it's founded by a couple of very prominent uh, Punjabis, uh, Mia Fazli Hussein, uh, Mia Muhammad Shafi, and Mia Shadin, uh, all of whom are quite prominent. They're landowners, though to different degrees, um, and they're also lawyers as well. And also they, they begin a tradition which marks the Muslim League from beginning to end, which is they begin fighting with themselves immediately after its creation. And the Punjab Muslim League is factionalized from then onward, uh, almost without break. But part of the story, part of the reason for that, I think, has to do with, with, with who these people are, what they're after, and the nature of Muslim community as they understand it. And what I'd like to suggest is that in understanding their image of the Muslim community, one has to look at the background of these people and the kind of framework, the model, the metaphors actually, that they use for thinking about community. And they're landlords and lawyers, and that's, that's not accidental. And I would argue that, that at the heart of their notion of Muslim community, right from the very beginning that defines the Muslim League, is the structure of British law and particularly property law. And that, in fact, it's the, the structure of property law in British India which creates the framework in which they conceive of what community is. And um, to, to get at the, just a, a, a brief background on this, I mean, I would argue, I mean, the British, of course, justify their rule in India by appealing to a concept called the rule of law repeatedly. 
And it's a very powerful legitimizing ideology for the British. I think to understand it, one has to immediately dissociate rule of law from notions of justice, which have nothing to do with it. But it's a kind of conception about how the state relates to the people and the communities that make it up. And at the heart of the rule of law in, in British India, or at least British conceptions, is this notion of property law, which is defined fundamentally by contract. The way property fundamentally is created under the British regime is through contracts which are essentially signed at the time of land settlements. Um, that is, the British go out and settle the land and they issue, you know, little puttas to say who owns what, and it's based on uh, uh, accepting a certain revenue payment in, in return for having rights which get recorded in the revenue documents and which then can be, uh, can be um, litigated, potentially, against others, but also critically, theoretically, against the state as well. And so the significance of this is that it's through property law that you first get a conception of a society defined with some autonomy from the state in the structure of property law and, and, uh, and contracts. Now, what's, what's interesting, I mean, is that built into that from beginning is a notion that community, that what community you, you belong to, is part of what shapes that contract. Because it's not just direct rights to property, but the rights as they're um, justiciable in court also depend on whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Hindu, whether you belong to a particular, in Punjab anyway, a tribe or a particular group, so, so that your standing as an autonomous being in, 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 in having a contract with the state immediately defines the individual as also marked by belonging to a particular community. And, and also, critically, it defines a notion of rights in those terms. And what really has struck me is that when you look at the early Muslim League, it's defined in terms of putting forward rights on be or, or asking, negotiating for rights on behalf of a community. And the notion of rights is not some abstract notion of human rights or personal rights so much as a notion of rights for which the model is property rights. That's, that's where the term comes from as it's used in the British system, and that's what, that's what, um, that's what drives it. And, and there's almost, and, and this may be going out of ways on a limb, but there's almost a sense in looking at this that um, community itself almost is viewed in this form as itself a, a, a form of property. It's what an individual brings to bear as part of the demand for rights. It's something that can be appealed to. And this, of course, operates on one level, on this, this property level, but it operates on another level in terms of asking for rights, meaning access in the system, access to power. So that the, the whole discourse of minority safeguards, um, setting aside of seats in the legislatures by certain percentages is all cast in this notion of negotiating for or demanding rights in a, in a, a framework that's, that's linked to this, this um, uh, property language. And, and it's really struck me because, I mean, you can see this in Jinnah's uh, language. But if you look at Punjab, you know, even more striking than Jinnah's language is the way this language is used by Sir Fazli Hussain, who is one of the founders of the Muslim League and is one of the dominant figures in Punjab politics all the way up to the mid-30s when he dies. And he repeatedly puts forward these claims for rights, percentages, for the Muslim community, positions set aside in the government. And it's always justified in this same kind of language, which strikes me anyway as a kind of property rights language. And it, it, it goes so far that at one point, and, and I think I've quoted this somewhere, there's this great comment for Fazl Hussain, and he's, this is in the debates around the time of the communal ward, and he's saying that 
you know, that the, the Punjabis by giving up a certain percentage of seats are, as he says, um, sacrificing 3% of their heritage, which just, I mean, what could that possibly mean? <laughs> Except it suggests this mindset which is just incredibly powerful. That's what the community is, something which negotiates on, on these terms. And, and what I would argue is that, that that persists as a central element in the language of the Muslim League from beginning to end. Um, however, it's, it's hardly the only language that's out there. And, and of course, what one first has to note is that in the Punjab, the, the way that this develops suggests clearly that if Muslim community can be used as a foundation for claiming rights based on this almost possessive notion of community, so can other forms of community. And in fact, this is the reason, among others, that I mean, Sir Fazli Hussein and Sir Muhammad Shafi fall out with each other and fight, and the Muslim League kind of falls apart for some time in the, in the, uh, in the Punjab in the face of that. Um, ultimately, what happens is Sir Fazli Hussein makes a decision in the early 20s that to participate effectively in the Punjab's political system, it makes more sense to organize around other identities than simply Muslim identity. This does not for a second mean that he's still not pushing for more rights for Muslims, which he does throughout his career. But, but in the Punjab, it's not just, of course, being a Muslim that affects your property rights and the way property is asserted, but Punjab has a system of customary law, which means that in the rural areas, uh, when you go to court to contest a, a, a property dispute, what matters is not generally if you're a, a Muslim or a Hindu, though that still does make a difference in urban Punjab. But in the countryside, it depends on whether, on what your tribal custom might be with respect to um, whether you can dispute a property claim with your cousins or whatever issues might, might be at stake. And this is, has all been codified, of course, in Punjab in a political sense with the Land Alienation Act, which makes these categories overtly political. And uh, so this becomes a foundation for, for politics, whereby asserting tribal identities is as effective a, uh, a mechanism for asserting rights as Muslim rights. And it's, again, quite interesting that you know, so-called zamindar rights in Punjab are asserted throughout the 20s and 30s uh, in exactly the same way Muslim rights are. Uh, positions set aside in administration. Um, seats in, in the legislature are not, there are no separate electorates for different tribes, but there are clearly separated urban and rural seats and in the rural areas customary apply, law applies and it does not in the urban areas. So, so, I mean, this creates a kind of framework where the Muslim League, in its very own language of minority rights, of course, has to compete with other notions of rights, which produce a, 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 a distinctive form of politics in the Punjab. But in any case, at the same time this is going on, it strikes me that there's another kind of vision of community, another understanding of what it means to belong politically to a community which is shaped by another aspect of British rule, which, re which is not the law, but rather the emergence of a public sphere of print and open discussion and uh, the press and publication. And that creates a very different kind of framework because within the framework of those kinds of debates which become already in the late 19th century have become important but become much more important uh, in, in the period after 1910. Um, but in any case, in, 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 those, in that context, notions of community and identity are, are produced as a result of public arguments that are going on and, you know, as many people have argued on the ways that these create 
imagined visions of community which which come out of the 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 structure of these these debates and 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 certainly in Punjab but in other places as well there's a strong tendency for a very different vision of what the Muslim community is as a kind of autonomous force that come out of these which is is rooted I, I mean it's it's it has a lot of different forms, but I would argue rooted particularly in the, the language of devotion, of commitment to particular Muslim symbols which are defended, often very emotionally defended, in public debate and in public action. And one can trace this through a whole series of uh, movements during this period. Um, Going back to, to uh, actually an issue that was discussed just a little bit earlier having to do with symbols of international, worldwide Muslim community which become very prominent in the press with respect to what's going on you know, during the, the Balkan Wars and during these, these developments in, in the Middle East and the Palestine issue is also quite prominent. Uh, but all, and ultimately the Caliphate issue becomes the big movement along those lines, but also with respect to symbols that are closer to home, such as in, in UP, the Kanpur Mosque, but in Punjab, again, a whole series of these, the, the uh, conflict over the Rangila Rasul incident, and perhaps the biggest and most important of all, the Shahid Ganj Mosque conflict which goes on for years and and really galvanizes a, 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 a lot of opinion. Um, so I guess the point the point here is that they create these these debates which are in part in print but are also acted out in in demonstrations. Uh, they create a, a, a different sort of vision of community, of what the Muslim community is, which is constituted by the degree to which people identify, often strongly and emotionally identify, with symbols of Islam. And, and as I've argued elsewhere, it, it, the, the metaphor of making the heart public is a key part of this, that it's, it's a kind of inner and autonomous form of identification which is made public through um, uh, through the press and through um, devotion. I mean I, I liked the phrase that sort of captures this comparison in, in uh, Zili Saab's paper of, of, the, of, of Shibli's about moving from Shimla to the Qibla which is exactly sort of what, what what's going on with this. But in any case I mean looking Looking at the, the rhetoric of this arena, I think, is quite interesting in sort of getting a sense of how this is constructed. And there, of course, in Punjab, um, a whole range of, of quite well-known newspaper editors, poets, authors, public orators who, who become famous for their language capturing this kind of devotion. I mean, probably the 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 most famous of these, the one who who uh, is sort of recognized as the the greatest orator of his generation, is um, Sayyid Atullah Shah Bukhari, who gives these just incredible speeches. Um, and and one of them, actually, this was in a government file. Somebody had heard one of his speeches, and uh, and there's a was a um, translation in the file which I came across and, and I have quoted this in an article but it's just an, an, an amazing speech about it's during the Rangila Rasul agitation and it's about devotion to the Prophet and what it means and he concludes with this I mean it goes through you know first the Prophet was such a wonderful person how could anyone have slandered him and the guy talks about how, you know, people are wailing and are in tears. And then he goes from that to this just, you know, notion about we really need to show sacrifice in the name of the prophet. And finally he concludes with this image that where he says, I wish that I could be thrown into a den of lions in order to show my love for the prophet. And I would consider myself fortunate 
if I remain conscious enough to hear my bones being cracked to show my love. And, and this, this captures something of this, but that's an extreme case. I mean, much more common, and here there are a lot of the ulama who participate in this as well, there's, there's an emphasis on the importance of these kinds of, of symbols for a definition of a community which is not encapsulated by the colonial regime, which stands outside it, which has its own independent identity. Um, what's interesting is, in the Punjab anyway, balanced off between the Unionist Party manipulating this this uh, language of identity based on tribal division, on the one hand, and this politics of devotional symbolism, on the other, the Muslim League in the Punjab in the 20s and 30s finds itself totally marginalized because, on the one hand, Jinnah can't compete with Sir Fazli Hussein, and on the other hand, he is not willing or interested in this language of devotionalism. He's very clearly linked to a vision of, of community which, as I said, I would interpret as really being rooted in property law as a metaphor for community. And uh, so as a result, I mean, the influence of the Muslim League in the Punjab very largely, I mean, it doesn't disappear entirely, but is, is completely marginalized. And when you get to the this Shahid Ganj mosque agitation which galvanizes politics in the Punjab, the Muslim League is nowhere to be seen. And Jinnah actually does come at one point to Lahore, I mean going back Venka to your point to try to mediate and in the end ends up wishing he hadn't. So maybe this influences him later on because he meets with various groups and though he thinks he's gotten some agreements, he, it ends up all being for naught and just making him look bad. So, in any case, so that's, that's the kind of framework. But then, what happens? Well, Jinnah, when he attempts to revitalize the, the, the League, he does so in this language of, of property, but it takes on new meaning, I would argue, with the Government of India Act of 1935, which um, creates expanded electoral arenas and the, the, in certain ways the structure of the electoral arena and the creation of an electoral system in some ways is built on this language of property. And, and that happens in two ways. One of course is the fact that property is the foundation for being able to vote. And the Government of India Act of 1935 expands the property-based franchise from what it had been earlier during the 1920s, but it's still very much a property-based franchise. So voters are only those who are, hold a, a, a significant amount of property, though tenants can vote under certain circumstances, but in general it's a property-based system. Though I might add that it's not an insignificant electorate in 1935. Um, I mean, if you, if you take the percentage of the um, adult population that can vote, um, it's fairly, I mean, it's nowhere near even 50 percent, but it's fairly substantial. I mean, it, it's around, I, I forget the exact figure, 15 to 20 percent of the adult population um, is able to vote. So it's a significant number. So property is at the, at, at, at the heart of this, but even beyond that, the reason property is at the heart of it is because there's a certain ideology that only property owners are ones who are capable of making the kinds of decisions that are necessary to, to, uh, um, to create a proper uh, elected system of representation. Um, so, so it's on the one hand a property system, but on the other hand, of course, elections also are conducted in public. The campaigns are conducted in public. So it, it brings together these other, this other form of, of rhetoric and community in the, uh, in the, in the electoral arena. Um, 
What's noteworthy, of course, is the fact that Jinnah fails entirely in this effort in the Punjab, as he does in some other areas as well, because he can't effectively compete again in either of those arenas. In the uh, urban seats in the Punjab, he, the Muslim League, I believe, wins one seat in 1937 in Punjab, which is far fewer than these other urban parties which have been playing this game, particularly in the Shaheed Ganj Mosque um, agitation uh, of, of public rhetoric focusing on the mosque as a symbol. So Moana Zafar Ali Khan's party, the Itihadi Millet and the Arar party all do better than the Muslim League does. And in the rural areas, he can't compete with the Unionists. So, I mean, it's that that forces Jinnah to go back to trying to strike a deal with the Unionists. Really, he's following in the footsteps here of Sir Fazli Hussein, who tried to play both these games at once, but he, he forms this pact with Sir Sikandar and, and brings the Muslim League and, and the Unionist Party together but generally to the greater benefit of the Unionists than of the Muslim League. So, so the Muslim League at this point, I mean, it's a political party in a certain sense. It, it has, it's based fundamentally on this, this property-based notion of, of uh, community. It's not very effective in making a broader appeal to community within the framework of uh, public debate. And, and public policy, and of course that's the context in which the Pakistan ideal is put forward. And one could see this as an attempt to put forward a symbol that would bring these notions of community together. That is, it's a symbol of devotion, but at the same time it's a state which will embody the rule of law, as Jinnah sees it. And, but, but what's significant in the Punjab, I mean, what really strikes me about the Pakistan idea is that it really does not catch on significantly. I mean, it's true, if you look in the early 40s, the Muslim League is increasing its support, the number of branches are increasing, but even so, so long as the, the uh, Unionist Party remains powerful, the Pakistan idea in and of itself does not have the capacity to really shape a, a fundamental transformation of, of Punjabi politics. So that right up until 1944, when the, the League and the Unionists finally break apart, the, 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 the League still very much is a minority party with relatively limited um, support in the, in the, um, in the population. And, and it's really only in the run-up to the elections in 1945 that one can see yet another vision of community entering into the League's notion of what it is and what the Muslim community is. And that's in direct response to this. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's not clear that the, the Muslim League could have actually defeated the Unionists without this, uh, this appeal. But what you get is, in the coming of the 1945 elections, a kind of rhetoric which takes off in the last few months before the elections which is very interesting because it's in some ways, um, it's highly contradictory. In some ways, it publicly repudiates the notion that the Muslim League is a political party at all. And, and the interesting thing is, the League, of course, attempts to organize using all the normal tools a political party does. It makes economic appeals. It issues a manifesto. It organizes local branches. It attempts to manipulate uh, broadly interests in different uh, districts. It attempts to use the influence of families. It does all this. And it's quite active in trying to do this. But nevertheless, um, what you get is a kind of rhetoric at this point, which in demanding a Muslim state argues that the elections that are coming up are not really a matter of party at all. They're a matter of some more fundamental, higher, and significantly apolitical 
commitment to the Muslim community, that it's not a political community at all anywhere anymore. It's a community that embodies a kind of higher principle, which is inherent in every individual as a Muslim is rooted in Muslim history, but ultimately is contradictory. The, the, it's something that transcends politics, which transcends everyday interest. And um, in fact, the rhetoric itself is often used in ways which it's hard not to see it as a critique of what the Muslim League itself has done. So, but anyway, uh, this comes through in, in, a, in, in a whole raft of posters and speeches and election rhetoric, and I just want to give a few examples of this just to illustrate, I mean, how this is a, yet a third, a very different notion of, of what the Muslim community is all about um, by, by just reading a couple of these, um, of these, uh, uh, these posters, and um, which, which interestingly, and this this relates to Aisha Jawal's argument, emphasize the, un the unity of the community above anything else. But interesting, it's not in the sense she talks about it, unity which is important for constitutional negotiations. So that is there, but it's about unity as a kind of ideal which in every individual is in tension with the other interests and everyday concerns that they have. So this is one poster. Uh, it, it's entitled, the heading is, these by the way are posters that, that were in Lahore Muslim League posters in the collection of documents that Mia Abdulaziz, who was the mayor of Lahore in the 1930s, kept. It says, become one. Uh, then it quotes a, a, a verse from the Quran and says, Remember, all Muslims are brothers. Above all, destroy casteism, sectarianism, faction, and bondage. These are all matters of ignorance, jahalat. Islam has interpreted all of these as products of the jahiliyat, of the era of ignorance. Coming together, all should become one. Keep before you one organization, one goal, one constitution. Islam is your only constitution. The millet is your only calm. The league only is your representative organization. Pakistan is your only goal. So I mean, the nuances of the difference between millet and calm and whatever just disappear entirely in this kind of, uh, of language. Um, Another, and this, this is, uh, this one, and I'll read a couple of these, relate to appeals that are made at the time of Muharram, which occurred in 1945, right before the elections. And so one says it's entitled, Ashra of Muharram and the Duty of All Muslims. The day of commemorating the memory of Shahidi Azam, Imam Hussein, has come. In the court of the pure imam, the time for Muslims to offer tears of love and faith has come. From the pure memory of shahid -e azam the ideals of sacrifice, purity, and righteousness are becoming fresh. History repeats itself. It is not a comparison of personalities. What relation is there between earth and the pure world? But see the amazing similarity of events. Those very same weapons that were used at the time of Hussein are being used even today to break the followers of Hussein's name away from the Islamic millet. It is the partisanship of error. At that time, offices and gifts of land, inams, were given by the government. Today, jagirs, offices, squares of land, and inams are being given. The enemy powers of Islam and the Muslims are prodigal everywhere in conspiracies. Today, in place of the imam, it is a test of the followers of the imam's name. The collective glory of the Muslims is on one side, and conspiracies to deceive and lead us astray are on the other. At the Ashra of Muharram, the eyes of Muslims are opening. Keepers of the prestige of the name of Hussein tell the world and the world's powers that for the glory of Muslims, we will come out successful in every test, through the model provided in Karbala by our pure exemplar. And just an, um, uh, 
another one that builds on this same uh, same notion. Um, Hussein is Shah, Hussein is Badshah, Hussein is faith, Hussein is the protector of faith. He gave his head but would not join hands with Yazid. In fact, Hussein is La Ilaha. The first lesson of the event of Karbala, the sacrifice of Hazrat Imam was for truth and only truth. The beloved of the Prophet spurned power and government in the path of Islam. This is the model of Hussein. So, I mean, this, this is about as clear. There, the argument is for Pakistan, and the model is that government is inherently corrupt. And uh, just to, to, to suggest a, a, a couple more which illustrate similar sorts of things, um, One of the key things in these is also the, the uh, reference in a number of these posters to uh, the concept of fitna or disorder or turning the proper order of things uh, away from how it should be. And the, 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 what's interesting in this is the, and I'm sorry, I'm having problems finding the the ones here, but, but the, the, um, the, the argument about fitna is that loyalties to caste, to baradri, to tribe, to other political parties, in fact to any political party, are, are put forward as um, challenges to the, the purity of the Muslim community and what, it's, what it ought to be. So here's another one of these posters. Whether you are a Sayyid, a Mirza, or an Afghan, whether, whatever you may be, say also that you are a Muslim. The enemies of Muslims are two. There actually, Iqbal is, there are a number of, yeah, there are a number of, of Iqbals, yeah. The enemies of the Muslims are two, Rongo Nasib, that is, the fitna of tribes and baradris, Mulko Vatan, that is, the idols of Qamiyat and Vatniyat. The fitna of color and genealogy is a product of the Jahiliyyah and is being provoked in the name of power and government. Qamiyat o Vatniyat, that is, the fitna of separating politics and religion, are being provoked in the name of India's independence. Muslims, break the idols of color and genealogy, country and homeland. Your izzat, the honor of your baradri and tribe, the honor of your family, are all from the honor of being Muslim, of Islam and being Muslim. That Muslim, that tribe, that baradri, that family is deserving of honor who advances in the service of Islam and the Muslims. The Muslim League has been, ta has taken, and raised, has been taken and raised up for this purpose. It is for this purpose that the Pakistan demand is being made. Support only Pakistan and the Muslim League. Again, what's interesting in this is this denunciation of the politics of Baradri and tribe, when precisely, of course, this is what the Muslim, doing, it, Muslim League is doing at this time. But again, the idea is here, a state is on the line, the creation of a state. And that's something that transcends politics. And that's the language that, that, uh, that runs through these, these posters. And, and it's interesting, I mean, of course, this isn't all that the Muslim League is doing at this time, this rhetoric, but it's, it's interesting how, how prevalent uh, it is. And, and also, how clear, I mean, one wonders about Pakistan, you know, and the, the ill definition of Pakistan as a, as a state, but what's really striking in these posters is that the Pakistan movement is cast as a movement really against state power as a general principle, as being corrupt. But it's only state power as it exists in the world. And there's this model, this ideal, that then allows for the creation uh, of a state that, that transcends these things. So this is yet a third 
kind of model of community that comes out of the Muslim League, and one has to say it's a completely different Muslim League that is putting forward this as than what they're putting forward, you know, when you, when you look at uh, Shafi and, and, and Fazli Hussein. And so I guess what I wanted to do just in going through this is to suggest that without putting it into this inevitable narrative of leading in one direction, one can actually look at what is the nature of the community at different times that the Muslim League is appealing to, what does it represent. And I think one gets a lot of insight into the coming of Pakistan when, that, when one does that. So let me stop there and uh, see what questions there might be. It's very stimulating, and at the same time, I'm not completely clear on the property model for community. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, but at the same time, it, it provokes a certain way of thinking in me. So I'm going to share it with you to sure. see if see if it helps if it, if it is helpful at all. Now you know when when in the Grundrisse Marx is writing about both you know the the movement from let's say community to the bourgeois individual and he's discussing from the property. You know, it's that section of the Grundrisse that Hobbes long first edited and published. That's the section I have free capitalist permission. Free capitalist permission, yeah. Um, when he comes to property, he thinks of property as a model for a relationship between humans and objects, right? And that's why he talks about the slave as the property of the slave owner, because the slave's body is like a hammer. I can put it to any kind of use I want. And therefore, he also thinks of property as a site of freedom, because property is also defined by your right of alienation. You can dispose of it. Right. So, uh, apart from, you know, I'm not even going into the, the, the Macpherson territory of the other notion of, this, you know, property in my body as my side of freedom, and, which is sort of, there's a connection between that. Yeah. Because, because, it's, because, because I have property in my body, I can sell my capacity to labor. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that, that's the property side of freedom. What I find interesting though, in trying to think about your instances, what is more helpful for me? is some of the recent criticisms of this mode of thinking. And in particular, you know, I have in mind my English department colleague Bill Brown's work on objects in American material culture. Mm -hmm. But what he's done, very interesting, is worked through a lot of American novels in trying to understand <coughs> relationship between humans and objects, property, in American everyday life as depicted in novels. Mm -hmm. And what he comes up with is, a, is an interesting uh, revision of, let's say, the kind of ideas that we're animating Marx, where, uh, very simply put, his idea is that the a possessive relationship between, uh, which is what we're calling property relationship, right? Um, it, the, the direction of possession works both ways. In other words, objects possess us in an interesting way when we enter a culture of possessing objects. And you know that helps me to think about, like you can see in your terms, when in the late 40s elections, like Pakistan is being sold as uh, really not a fixed agent sort of you know, bounded entity, but as, as all kinds of uh, imaginative, imaginary entities for which you make sacrifice. So, you know, you know, when you make sacrifice for something that is an object-like thing for you, right? It, it is that object that owns you. You know, the, you know the, in the same way that the slave could be forced to make sacrifice for the slave owner, because, because the slave is disposable, you can sacrifice it. That relationship can possess you in such a way that you sacrifice yourself for that relationship, right? And then the sense of, Possession works the other way. So, in, in, so interestingly, it seems to me that that one can think of community, uh, a certain kind of community, precisely as the reversal of that object relationship, where the logic of my sacrificing myself or making sacrifices on behalf of the community, right? It it is actually where I am possessed 
yeah. by the sense of community. So, so it, it, but but all of these thoughts, as I understand them, now belong to a mode of revising the traditions of property thinking I earlier read in Marx, right? Where the sense of where possession was a very one-way relationship. The way in which you defined possession as a site of freedom was precisely by the idea that the possessor could get rid of what was possessed and in that sense had an autonomy over what was possessed. Whereas the idea that you know Bill Brown and others are putting forward is precisely that, uh, that the possessed <laughs> actually possessed me. And, and in that sense, um, in that it, it kind of, as you can see through the use of the word possession in a slightly different sense, it, it makes the question of property both murkier and more interesting. Yeah, I, I mean that's very interesting and, and but what I would suggest, I mean just this is just based on as far as I understood, you know what you were saying is that there that the, the two notions that I was talking about in fact both involve possession but very different meanings for possession because it sounds like what you're describing when you talk about the you know the possessor also being possessed by the object you know this is this is the same language you find in in a lot of this you know rhetoric of sacrifice and devotion I mean and which you find of course in Urdu poetry that the 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 lover is also possessed by the beloved you know and in the same way, an individual who See, but there, it moves away from the legal definition of property. Absolutely, it's a different yeah. definition. But but what I would I would say is that there is also a legal realm in which a very different yeah. notion of property is going on, yeah. and in which there's a sort of more overt notion of uh, possessing an identity as as a something that, that um, enables one to assert rights within the context of a or particular, particular or political order. Or particular. Yeah, but what I'm saying is both things seem to be going on. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, yeah. that, so that one is, so the, the very idea of property there becomes, it contains more meanings than just the legal. Well, I would be a little hesitant to, to use the term property to, to, to in the second sense. I mean, possession, perhaps, but in a different sense. That's than, what makes it murkier. Yeah, yeah. Almost, yeah. As, almost a spectral aspect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can make it even murkier, isn't it? <laughs> By thinking of another very central dimension of Marx, the theory of alienation, that you are the object that you yeah. create rules of Right. Exactly. The object, yeah. If you like that property. Is, yeah. I mean, uh, normally that is applied to the alienation of the worker. But actually it goes deeper. Yeah. That's what it is the alienation in a sense of the capitalist story. Yeah. Right? Like his remark somewhere in Capital, that accumulate, accumulate, that is, what is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, this but is what, a kind of a possession of the capitalist. So the the must make money. Of Otherwise, why should he say when accumulate? What's the point of the multi-million can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, you guys can talk. Just a little rejoinder to what Dipesh was saying that yeah. here, uh, I suppose the model that you are presupposing is one of the lonely individual faced with property and a kind of reciprocity between the two. No, not necessarily, because even the notion of community is if it's based on communal property. Mm -hmm. or communal labor, then okay. as a community you can have the right of alienation. So, it's in, I mean, in what, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that what I'm questioning mm -hmm. is the way in which, not David so much, but Marx, mm -hmm. runs the idea of freedom and property parallelly mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Right. In order to have legal right to property in a biradari context, you have to be possessed by the community. And to your possession of that's property, what I'm which yeah. adds another yeah. 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 And then the, then the word possession slightly changes yeah. sense yeah. because... Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, that's, that's true, but what's interesting also is, I mean, within the framework of Varadri, you can, as a an individual, go to court by yourself <laughs> and use your Varadri identity to make claims against others within your group. Yeah. 
Um, so, in a sense, you yes, possess I mean. that identity individually, even as you're inescapably part of the group, and therefore, I suppose, you know, possessed by the group as well. Mm -hmm. Name, sir. <laughs> no, I was just going to Coming back, I understood in more humbler, you know, humbler yeah. terms, uh, and basically thinking in terms of <coughs> the words that were used in common language, uh, setting aside. I mean, like Zilli Sahab was talking, that, saying that Shibli is writing, you know, galvanized the whole Muslim community. So what he had in mind really educated Muslims who could read Urdu. Yeah. You know. It didn't mean all the scheming millions, you know, in mean streets. Uh, so that's why, you know, there was the idea of the sahib haisiyat law, and haisiyat implied, you know, certain property. And then from moving from sahib haisiyat, Mia Fazal Hussain, then he invokes that the notion of biradri, which doesn't necessarily mean those people with great status and great property, but even anybody who has, who is of a humbler status, yes. as far as Haisir is concerned, he is humble, but yet being, being part of the Biradri, yeah. he is, I mean, and then at the third stage we invoke this totally in empty notion into which anything can be put, and a sense of masavat, of equality, you know, ek hi sab mein khade ho gaye, Mahmood Ayaz, that whole vision comes in, you know, that Jinnah with his uh, elegant silk suit and the poor, you know, we were in Azamgarh, they can all stand and pray together, and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I thought there was a kind of development, and I think that's when those, uh, those vocab, the vocabulary itself used by the people, not in English, yeah. but in their Punjabi, in their Urdu, I think I suggest, would be suggestive of this kind of notion which are there and very, very forceful, very, you know, impressed, uh, effective on people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just, uh, it's, it's interesting, I mean, we're reading through this Muslim League stuff, though, it's interesting the way, the, the incredibly ambiguous way that a lot of terms of, you know, in Urdu are used, like the term calm, for example, in, in just these same things is at times used to mean the Muslim community, and it's very positive. And exactly the same word is used for the nation when it's being used in the negative sense. And of course, the same word is also used for brotherly. So it, it's, um, it, it's and, and so it's hard to know. I mean, one assumes Actually, that these- It's used in very positive sense, and marriage is being arranged. <coughs> Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, David, please. Sorry. Well, I, I, I think you have a real insight in talking about the role of law, but I, uh, I'm not sure it's just a matter of property. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, being a Muslim or being any of those categories uh, was a civil status mm -hmm. more generally that uh, 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 was recognized one was, was that by birth, counted by, uh, that by birth, and from that things followed, in uh, which would have to do with marriage and uh, not just property rights, but other 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 civil law issues uh, under under British rule. Now in Punjab, you have this peculiar uh, situation of the of the conflict mm -hmm. between. Um, the so-called caste and tribes, customary law stuff, and the and the uh, and the Muslim law stuff, mm -hmm. and and that's something that's an issue at the time. So mm -hmm. Zafar Ali Khan is also a large point. Um, uh, his family uh, uh, insisted, or he insisted, that uh, that Islamic law of inheritance uh, rather than Rajput law of inheritance mm -hmm. uh, uh, be be uh, enforced in. in, in uh, and that, that was something that people took to court, you know, mm -hmm. at, at, at the time. And it became a matter of principle that I have to be considered as a Muslim and not as something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't have to be just property. It could be uh, uh, other sorts of issues. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's no doubt true. I mean, but, but I mean, what really strikes me is how overwhelming the property issue is in the British 
structure of law. I mean, property is the way into most other issues. I mean, for example, even with marriage issues, mostly they come into court with respect to property issues. Well, restoration not always. of conjugal rights. Yeah, no, not always. <laughs> but, but again, I mean, the very it's notion very of rights is, is a, yeah. is a in, in the British system, very much comes out of property rights. Yeah. 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 Yeah.